Okay, welcome everybody once again for our closing keynote. Uh, we have the honor of presenting Michael Bolton, who is here with us today. Please give a warm welcome to Michael. Uh, Michael will be holding a three-day workshop also after this uh, in the next week. Unfortunately, it's sold out, so you don't have a chance anymore. So. Until next time. Everybody. Until next time, of course. So next year again. So, Michael, without further ado, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's great to see everybody here to listen to a tester. <laughs> That's just amazing. That's great. And then I thought, no, wait, there's beer after. <laughs> So, and there's no seats out there, so that's why you're here. Um, I'll tell you about me being here. Uh, uh, this is a really fortunate thing, because I had full classes all this week uh, in the Netherlands, long way away, um, relatively speaking. Um, and then this morning, at 7 o'clock, I'm about to get on my plane, and I can't, because <laughs> that's what it looks like in Zagreb. Um, and at the plane that I was on... Well, it, I think its ILS wasn't working, its instrument landing system wasn't working, so it couldn't land in the fog. I am the ultimate bug magnet. And um, <laughs> then when I, I landed, poor Davor here, and thank you so much for inviting me and for taking such good care of me and for picking me up. Davor uh, arranged all this. <laughs> well, we made him wait, not just for the hour late flight, but the baggage handlers at Zagreb Airport kind of like sort of forgot that there were bags on my plane, and that was an extra 45 minutes. I am a bug magnet. And I'm also, so I'm really tired. I got up at 4.30 this morning uh, after being up until 11 o'clock last night, my plane going to Vienna, and then the plane this morning coming here left at 7. So I had to be up at 4.30 to get to the airport. And so I just don't care about anything. <laughs> I'm going to collapse at the end of this talk, probably, so th uh, this will hasten it along. Where's Courtney? Is Courtney here? She is so excited about drinking a beer uh, uh, from the conference, and I share that. So good health to you all. Let's get started. This is what people call a test case. I, I, they call it a test, even. Oh, my God. It's so wrong. But here we go. Given when, then? Given that I'm a human being and I'm a passionate, committed tester, when people talk about agile software development and reduce it to a bunch of formulaic keywords and reduce testing to mechanistic checking and reduce qualifications to multiple choice questionnaires on certification tests, tests, uh, and they dismiss deep and skilled and rich and inexpensive and fast testing. And as a consequence of all that, they don't help make life better for people. Then, as a grumpy old man, I get upset and I have too much to talk about in only one hour. I noticed, though, if you look at these uh, uh, cards here, there's no ending time. <laughs> so I can go on as long as I want. Except, except, I, yes, here's a case where we're not under time pressure for testing, except there's beer at the other end. I'm not stupid enough to think you're going to put up with this for very long, so. Uh, why do we test? Why do we have testers at all? I was a program manager for a, a very important software company in the 1990s. It was a very non-existent uh, software company in the 2000s, because that's the way the software business works. And I was a program manager. And when I was a program manager, I think I was like pretty much every other program manager on earth. I wanted an answer to this question. Everything else I wanted, everything else I wanted was in service of an answer to this question. Are there problems that threaten the on-time successful completion of the project? Or are there problems that threaten the value of the product? That's it. All that other stupid stuff that management is asking you for if you're a tester all those weird things that they're making, all the pass-fail metrics, they're asking you that because they want, really, in their heart of hearts, what they want is an answer to this question, which is, are there problems that threaten the value of the product, that threaten the on-time successful completion of the project? 
And so a lot of the time we uh, set up test cases to ask pass or fail questions. But testing is not about that, not in my view. Other people may argue with me, and actually that would be kind of fun, because at least one of us will learn something if we have an argument. Uh, I don't mind argument. Argument's a good thing. We need more argument in this business instead of people standing in front of a, in front of a room unchallenged. So skill testers focus on exactly two questions. As they're testing, as they're sitting in front of the keyboard, they ask themselves, referring to the product that they're interacting with, they ask themselves, is there a problem here? I don't test for passing test cases or failing test cases. I don't test for correctness. What I'm interested in is the existence, the presence of a problem. So that I can help managers ask the question, answer the question, is there a problem that threatens the value of the product? But then I'm also looking up over my shoulder at, at my colleagues and, and, and the developers and the managers who are watching me test, and I'm banging into obstacles all the time. I'm running into things that are slowing my testing down, making it harder. I'm seeing uh, uh, problems with the product too, and what I'm asking those managers and to the rest of the team, what I'm asking is, are you okay with that? Are, are you okay with this? Are, are, are we okay with all this? Because if they're okay with that, if my testing is harder or slower, I can deal. But I want to make testing go faster and easier, and I need their help sometimes to do that so that I can answer the question, is there a problem here? Really quickly and really thoroughly. I'm a manual tester, people ask me. How do I fit in on an agile team? You're not a manual tester. He's not a manual programmer. She's not a manual product owner. Testing is neither manual nor automated. Nobody does manual doctoring, goes to see a manual doctor. Nobody does manual parenting. There are no manual researchers. That's not a manual manager over there. There's no automated managers, and there's no automated researchers, and there's no automated parent. Well, with, t with the, the TV, actually, is sort of an automated parent, isn't it, in a funny way? Uh, but uh, there's no manual doctoring or automated doctoring. Testing is neither manual nor automated. Testing, well, I'll tell you what testing is in a sec. What the tester is asking me there is, I, I'm not a programmer. How do I fit into an agile team if I'm not a programmer? Because everybody wants me to be a programmer, and they want me to automate the test cases. Ah! Ah! Testing is not about test cases. Pilots don't use piloting cases, and parents don't use parenting cases, and researchers don't use research cases, managers don't use managing cases, programmers don't use programming cases. Journalists, uh, uh, investigative reporters don't use journalism cases. Can you think of another profession in which people use the case in the same way that testers do? as the, the, the unit of work. It's crazy. Why are we still doing this? What's that? Lawyers. 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 Lawyers don't use lawyering cases. Lawyers work on a case. That's a very different interpretation of case. I, but I appreciate you coming up with an answer. That was really good. And uh, doctors sometimes refer to cases. They refer to patients as a case. But they don't use medicine cases when they're treating the patient, right? For a lawyer, a case is more like a product. Right? For, for a, a, a doctor, uh, a patient is, is more like a product. They're not a, a, a patient case. Why resist that? Why resist framing testing as test cases? Because testing is fundamentally about exploration, experimentation, discovery, learning, investigation. It's about taking that stuff and feeding it back in to subsequent cycles of that. Testing is development of knowledge about a product. And it's about reporting, too, so that our, our clients and our, our, our uh, developers can make informed decisions about things that they want to do with the product. So that they can make an informed decision about whether the product they've got is the product they want. The problem with test cases is that they focus on checking the output, confirmation. At, demonstrating that the product works. But the product can't be shown to work. You can show that the product can work, but you can't show that the product does work or that it will work. That's only an inference. And what I want to see is I want to find problems in the product so that uh, uh, managers and, and clients can be alerted to that. Plus, when people turn testing into test cases, they start counting them. And we should know the kind of mischief that that causes. And when people turn testing into counting, 
rather than assessment or evaluation or, or, or generating evidence, we lose information. We start to become dysfunctional as an organization and distortion of what's going on begins. Uh, you want to make your test, uh, test rate, uh, pass rate fail? Or because I was up at 4.30 in the morning. Hang on. This should help. Now I'll be fine. <laughs> the silliest thing we do in testing, I think, is to, to produce pass-fail ratios. You want that to get better? You want your pass rate to increase? Run fewer failing tests. Or checks, as we would call them. Let's call this checking and not testing. Checking is operating a product mechanistically, like a machine, with a machine, to uh, check specific facts about it which means setting up the product, operating it, observing it, interacting with it in very specific algorithmic ways to collect specific observations of its behavior, capture its output, and then apply algorithmic decision rules to those observations, and then report the output of the evaluations algorithmically. Is there a key word that I've seen to be using here? Like a spelling checker, or like a compiler. But just because the, the product passes all the compiler checks doesn't mean that the, the product is any good. It means that a machine has gone through and done certain kinds of syntactical checking to see if the uh, uh, rest of the, comp uh, the uh, compiler is going to get confused by it. So a check can be performed by a machine, a machine which cannot think but which has the virtue of being very fast, very precise, very specific. Or a check can be performed by a sufficiently disengaged human being, a human being who has been instructed not to think at all and who is slow and variable. But notice something about those quick and precise, slow and variable things. The quickness and the slowness refer to the speed of observable behaviors. That is, the banging of fingers on keys the uh, ticking off of boxes next to expected, predicted, desired results. But if there's a problem that the machine hasn't been programmed to recognize, then the machine is going to be infinitely slow at recognizing that problem. It's just not going to do it. It's not going to do it. Machines don't test. People test. And people use machines in powerful ways to help them test. That's a big theme of our work. Testing is way more than checking. Checking can be OK. Uh, checking can be really useful. Uh, uh, checking can uh, help us to determine that a long sequence of events, a lot of things went right in that sequence of events. But it can't tell us about a thing that's gone wrong that the check wasn't prepared to notice or log. So it's focused on confirming what we know checking is, confirming what we believe or hope to be true. But to understand our products, and understand how problems in those products might matter to people, we've got to do something more than that. We have to test. To test means, oh, it includes operating a product algorithmically to check specific facts about it. It includes that. We can do lots of that. But testing is something bigger than that. Testing is evaluating a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation, which includes, to some degree, questioning the product, studying the product, modeling the test space, and modeling risk, and, and modeling coverage, and modeling oracles. Uh, uh, testing includes generating ideas and, and expanding on ideas that we generated on, and then refining ideas that we've expanded. And then it also includes abandoning ideas that we've overproduced, and then recovering ideas that we've abandoned. And it includes navigating our way through the application, manipulating the application, reconfiguring it, changing it, uh, 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 making maps, conjecturing, making inferences. None of these things that machines can do. Not one of them. And sometimes people say to me, what about machine learning? The, the words machine learning to me do violence to the idea of what it means to learn something. What machines do is they collect data and they use powerful algorithms to refine that data and represent, represent that data to us, not go out and discover it on its own. We've programmed the machines to do that. 
We are agents. We're the ones who did it. Yay, us. But actually, testing is more than that. Testing is creating the conditions necessary to do all those things so that our clients can make informed decisions about risk. And in order to do that, testing has to be something even more than that. Testing has to be about acquiring and developing the skill, the inclination, the, the, the desire, the reputation for creating the conditions necessary for evaluating a product by learning about it through exploration and experimentation, which, by the way, also can include operating it algorithmically to check specific facts about it. That stuff can't be automated. Oh, and by the way, if our research, if our investigation, if our experiments and our reports are useful, that information can be put to use by our clients, by our developers, by our managers, to help make the product better too. Why is it important to distinguish between uh, testing and checking? Because checking is made explicit. It can be made completely explicit and automated. Think about biting and eating. Eating is a social activity. We, we engage in it socially mo most of the time. And we prepare food to eat for other people. Nobody confuses biting and eating. Your mother never said to you, and make sure you remember, good biting is part of a healthy lifestyle, <laughs> right? Nobody ever says around about 11.30, I didn't have breakfast this morning. I'm going to have to bite something at noon. And you know what's cool about biting? Biting can be automated, right? We can automate the biting in various kinds of ways. <laughs> Biting can be performed by tools, but eating can't be done by tools. Eating is a human activity, just like testing and checking. To test is to develop stories. It's to develop three stories about the product. A story about the status of the product, what it is, what it does, how it works, how it doesn't work, how it might not work in ways that matter to our clients. It's also about telling a story about how we tested, what we did to set up the product, how we configured it, how we operated it, how we observed it, how we evaluated it, how we made decisions about whether there was a problem here or not, the oracles <coughs> that we applied. And it's also a story, and testers aren't really great at telling this story, a story about where we've tested the areas of the product we've tested in, what we've done, and testers are really bad at this, unfortunately, so it seems, what we haven't done yet that might be important to our clients, and what we're not going to do at all unless things change. It's also a story about the quality of our testing, why the testing that we did was the most fabulous testing that we possibly could have done, and to the degree that it wasn't, why it wasn't how it worked, what got in our way and what made things slower, what made testing more difficult, how the conditions around the project made the product less testable, how because of the fact that we're using a, a brand new libraries that we wrote in-house that we've never used before uh, are making it harder and slower to test because once we got a lot of new code to test, that makes it harder to test unless the developers have been doing some unit checking on their own, which makes it easier to test. Intrinsic testability of the product. When that's better, then testing becomes easier. Because among other things, we're not finding shallow bugs. When developers help us test, we can help the developers look really good by finding deep or rare or hidden or subtle problems that matter. So, the story about what we've tested and what we haven't tested, that's a story about coverage. The story about the quality of the testing, how good our testing was, or how good it could be, that's a story that I'm afraid testers just don't seem to be very good at at all. Oh, we complain about stuff to other testers. We do that lots of times. But we could be way better at helping our managers understand the faster and easier testing is, the more valuable it can be. 
and there's lots of things we talk about in the rapid software testing space. We call those things, things that get in the way of testing, make it harder or slower, we call those things issues. Anything that slows down testing or makes it hard. Now look at this. Look at this. When you look at these three parts of the testing story that weave their way around each other, ask yourself, can that be automated? Can that be automated? Why are testers even worried about automated testing? Programmers aren't worried about automated programming. If we could have automated testing where we could have some kind of tool, some kind of agency that would look at the code and say, we can see all the problems in this, we would automatically have a program that would be capable of writing that code too. And I think we all know, developers and testers alike, we all know that's not happening anytime soon because it's our job as technologists, people who work as programmers, people who work as testers, to link the world of humans and machines. That's what we do. And machines don't do that. Machines have no competence, no capacity, no ability to link the world of human, humans and machines. You know why? Because as humans, we can understand the world of machines. Machines don't understand us because they don't understand anything. Machines don't explore. And then somebody says, they usually say it faster than that. They usually say, but Michael, what about the Mars Explorer? The Mars Explorer explores. Bullshit. The Mars Explorer does not explore. The Mars Explorer does not even know that it's on Mars. Right? You never, you don't hear the Mars rover saying that's one small step for a rover, one giant leap for rover kind. That's not going to happen. So testing can't be automated. And now we will move briefly to the entertainment portion of the presentation. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yes. That's it. You could, it, it, thank God you didn't waste that half hour, right? <laughs> okay. You're going to do this? Can, come on, all of us, can we do it? Oh, somebody. Just need some, everybody. Don't need everybody to do it. Need a little help, okay? Now it's a little fast for a 4.30 in the morning guy. No, too fast. OK, good. Experimentation learning, freestyle exploration, studying and modeling, conjecture, observation, test code development, task prioritization, checking out competitors, preparing simulations, formalized reporting to comply with regulations, gathering, assessing, and applying information, deliberation, judgment, designing visualizations, setting up the lab to try complex configurations, working out the problems in a puzzling situation, finding ambiguity in a product specification, trying to look beyond the predicted expectation. Well, that's because testing is all about investigation, questioning and learning, playful product and interaction, trying to keep my focus while I'm managing distraction, sense-making, myth-breaking, decision-making, no faking, stressing out the product to discover where it's breaking, interrupted, disrupted because the product's full of bugs, the fellows who developed it must have been on drugs, refining test approaches through deliberate practice, how could hackers hack this, don't give them access, wrestling with the problems in the setup of environments, interviewing users to discover their requirements, so I shall socialize to promote collaboration collaboration. Other folks can help me with my testing preparation. Talking with the managers to learn what they require. Testing for charisma, that's what customers desire. Working with the marketers to show the app's power, point to all the features, try to finish in an hour. Selecting, configuring, and then applying tools. Remembering critical thinking, confirmation is for fools. Refactoring at every step, keeping things maintainable. Let's get over overtime and make the pace sustainable. Building coverage models, analyzing risk, eliminating waste, trying to keep the pace brisk. Pattern recognition, distributed cognition, trying to help shy colleagues get over inhibition. I want to say this while I'm in a rap rhythm. A checks apart to testing encoded an algorithm. Testing's much more than automated checks and test cases. Human variation puts a product through its paces. Talk of manual testing will keep our craft stuck, but testers keep referring to it. I say, what the? Use the tools powerfully. That's what I'm suggesting, but don't try to tell me you can automate the testing. Presenter drop. <laughs> I'm just terrified that's what I'm going to be remembered for. Look, 
You want to be a tester? about my mission, who my client is, and who I'm responding to, who the, who the uh, stakeholders are. Uh, I ask questions about the information that's available to me. Developers are special, so I want to make sure my relations uh, with them are really good, and I want to know who's on the test team. Is it just me or a bunch of other people? What are our skills? What do we have? What do we need? What do we, what do we need to know? I ask about the uh, 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 equipment and tools. Oh, what's my test lab look like? What's available to me? I ask about the schedule. How often do we get filled? So it's a heartbeat of the project. Is there a, a big milestone coming up? When do we release? How long are our sprints? I ask about the test item. We'll talk about that in a second. I ask also about the deliverables. What's my client going to want me to produce and show to them and deliver to them? Probably bug reports, but also test reports and test data and analysis and graphs and charts and tables of stuff that will help me and other testers to test. And then, is it product elements? Is that what it says up there? I bet it is. I bet it is. I look at the product elements. I look at the product structure, the bits and pieces. I look at the function, what the product does. I look at the data that the product processes. If it does stuff, what does it do stuff to? That's data. I look at the interfaces with which uh, I can get access to the product, put stuff in, take stuff out, observe it on the inside. I look at the platforms on which the product depends, and maybe stuff depends on the product, so I look at that too. I look at the operations that people use on the product. I look at the way they use it, the context in which they use it, and I look at how the product interacts with time, how time and the product interact with each other. And then I look for problems in the things that use its value, quality criteria, like capability, reliability, usability, charisma, security, scalability, compatibility, performance, installability, and then development-related quality criteria like supportability, uh, uh, supportability, testability, maintainability, portability, localizability. And then I think about test techniques, function testing, domain testing, stress testing, flow testing, scenario testing, claim testing, user testing, risk testing, and automated checking. And then I look at principles and a whole bunch of other stuff. But I'm thinking also in terms of feelings, and I'm thinking in terms of logical relations to things that uh, um, would represent an inconsistency with something desirable. And I look at artifacts, and I look at tools. And when I look at the principles, I think about I, I think about patterns of familiar problems. I think about explainability. I think about uh, how the product represents, faithfully or not, the world. I think about the product's history, the image that the company is trying to project, the claims that important people are making about it, comparable products. I, I look at what users might reasonably desire. I look at consistency of the product within itself. I look at the purpose for which the product is intended, either explicitly or, or implicitly by the designer. And I look at standards and statutes and laws and regulations and rules, uh, protocols that the product I have to adhere to. See? Whole thing, right? Whole thing. When you can talk about this stuff like you know what you're talking about, then the amateurs don't give you any crap. <laughs> I asked the tester the other day, what's risk? And he said, uh, probability times impact? Oh, God, no, 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 no. That's just a formula. That's just a formula. Risk is so much more than that. Risk is so much more than that, as we shall shortly see. So how do I do agile testing, testers ask? Start with this idea. Testing is testing. Testing is always testing. Testing is always an investigation of the product. Testing is always gathering information with the intention of helping people to inform decisions. Agile is a particular context in which testing happens. What does a business want? The business wants a product of high value, right? That's what the business wants. And, of course, the business wants it at low cost. See, the high value of the product, that's how the business plans to keep customers happy and thereby make money. Well, in order for that to happen, we've got to build it. That's how the business gets something in at once. We build stuff. Developers do that. Testers participate in that, help out with that. But uh, uh, the builders build it. And then we want to do that at low cost because that 
helps make the business sustainable and profitable. And then we study it, because that's how we find out whether the business got what it wanted. And then we feed back that in again into a loop. See, this is the way, this is not just agile. This is the way all development works. We discover something worth building. And then we build some of it. And we build it virtuously. We build it virtuously. We build it in the finest way we possibly can. And then we study what we built. Now, in the old days, the traditional development cycle, we discovered something we're building. We build some of it. That is to say, almost all of it. Right? We take nine months. I, I just was talking to a guy, uh, a friend of mine who's been working on a project. He came into it in February of this year, and he quit last week. This was a project that had been going on for three years. And the first time uh, the product had ever made contact with a user was uh, a, a just before February, just before he was hired. They'd gone for two or three years without ever talking to a single person. It, it was an enterprise. Where's Zoran? It was an enterprise software project. Just like you were talking about. That game! It was exactly that kind of thing. They built almost all of it. And now, because we're building almost all of it, when we study what we built, we know that there's going to be big problems. So what we try to do is we try to get it right the first time. That's what it means to build it virtuously in the traditional environment. So that makes development slow, ponderous, expensive, over-documented. Well, we try to get it right the first time. You know what happens, because we're human. Hey, look at all the bugs when we study what we built. So after the first long loop, then there are a bunch of short, panicky loops. <laughs> right? The developers were taking, uh, there's a one-year project, and the developers took, you know, a year and two months. And the testers were supposed to have six weeks to test it. And, well, of course, now, since we're behind schedule, the developers get two weeks to test it, uh, or the uh, testers get two weeks to test it, which is it's, it's a stupid way to program. Anyway, you know, I read today, because I was wondering, <laughs> am I ever going to leave Vienna Airport? What would it take? What if I got, like, a, what if I drove? What if I rented a car, got an Uber or something? And Google told me four minutes and 17, or four hours and 17 minutes to get here. But you know, if I were driving from Vienna to Zagreb, I would not have a four-hour driving phase and then a 17-minute looking out the window phase. But that's what traditional development talks about. It talks about a programming phase or development phase and then a testing phase at the end. That is a crazy way to run. Look, if you, it's like a looking out the window phase that happens at the very end of the project. Why are we not looking out the window all the way through? Why are we not testing all the way along? Because there's this weird belief that we have to have an entire product to test. We don't. Our job as testers is to learn how to apply critical thinking to every stage of the product, every bit of building, every little function and feature. We can learn. We're capable of learning how to test those things and how to spot trouble when it's a little tiny bit of trouble instead of a great big huge wad of trouble that we, we discover at the end of the project. And, you know, just as traditional development uh, uh, models uh, were stupid and dopey, then along comes uh, uh, the uh, formalizers and the certificationists who create this. Look at this. Testing is an assembly line. Whoop, look at that. And then because it's too long to fit on a single page, they have to bend it back the opposite way. This is actually from ISO 291, uh, They worked on this for seven years. Very detailed, very thorough, very, uh, uh, a very careful review of the whole thing. And this diagram did not change in seven years. That's the kind of testing they do at ISO, well, in the ISO uh, uh, Standards Committee. Uh, brought to you by certificationists. Still partying like it's 1999. <laughs> Look, ma, no loops. No learning feeding back into it. Then came Agile. Woo! Yeah, Agile. Manifesto for Agile Software Development came out uh, around the year 2000. James Bach, my colleague, was going to be there at the big meeting at Snowbird. But his wife decided that he was tired and told him, no, don't go. Oh. Oh, and testing never got invited to the Agile party where the XP people had been for so long. It was such a wonderful potential, and it never happened. But... 
on the whole, Agile's a pretty wonderful thing. We're uncovering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we've come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Oh my God, what a breath of fresh air. Working software over comprehensive documentation. Who wouldn't want that? Customer collaboration over contract negotiation. Right, 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 because things change. Things change, and it'd be really good to stay in close contact with the customer to say, hey, here's what we got. You like it? Oh, you don't like it so much, but it's what we thought you said you wanted. Oh, it's not exactly what you wanted. Okay, we can fix it. Responding to change over following a plan. And then this other bit that a lot of people forget, because, listen, there is some value in processes and tools, process models and tools, I think is what they meant. Comp the, the comprehensive documentation? I don't know, but there's value in documentation. And people, it's, a, it's okay to work with the, to a contract, and it's okay to follow a plan to some degree. So while there's value in the items on the right, we just value the things on the left more. Sounds good to me. And then the only funny thing about this is we are uncovering better ways of developing software. You know, I, I, I looked at it for the first time a couple of years ago, and I thought they had said discovering, and I was going to be mad at them, but uncovering was right because those things got covered up 30 years ago. Uh, back in the 1950s and 60s, in the early days of software development, it was happening like this. It was happening like this. Everybody who worked on a piece of software could read source code, probably, or at least were working really closely with people who could read source code. And, and software development got mediated. We got farther and farther away from the people from whom or for whom we were building software. And I, I think that was a, a tragic incident, a tragic uh, way of th doing things. So Agile made a couple of changes. And you know, a couple of really small changes to the universal cycle of development, but they're really significant despite the smallness of them. Number one was, instead of building some of it, the Agilists said, let's build almost none of it. Let's build just a teensy little bit of it, and then we will build it with change. That's how, oh, that's how we're going to change, build it virtuously. We're going to change build it virtually, virtuously from get it right the first time, knowing that we're not going to get it right the first time. Let's build it with change in mind because we recognize that we're going to make some mistakes along the way or there's going to be some miscommunication. And if we build it with change in mind, then when we study what we built, we can discover problems and fix them right away, relatively speaking. Little changes. It's easier to find both little and big problems when you're making little changes. And that means lots of short loops so we don't get ahead of ourselves. As a tester, when this came out, and as a program manager too, and as a developer, I was working as a developer at the time, this sounded great to me. This sounded really terrific. What a wonderful way to go. Little changes, little experiments. It was, you know, it was like, a, 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 imagine tasting your food as you're cooking it. Wouldn't that be wonderful? So uh, let's sum up what it means to do agile development, and uh, then we'll talk about how we do uh, uh, rapid software testing in that context. Oh my god, I got a lot of slides still. Um, let's deliver frequently so we can evaluate the product frequently too. Let's uh, bust down the, uh, so the walls between roles. Let's develop the sense of craftsmanship. Let's focus on skill. The early agilists especially, right, the XP people, they were really, really into being responsible for the quality of their work. Don't be too formal. Don't over-document and don't over-structure your process model. Experiment. Learn from your experiments. Try stuff. Make failure inexpensive. Make your environment tolerant to failure. Make a fault-tolerant environment. Build and, and use your tools expertly, as craftspeople do. And this one gets forgotten all the time. Seek a sustainable pace. I get testers coming up to me all the time and saying, I work in an agile team, and the developers work for like 10 days, you know, Monday through Friday, and then Monday through the following Wednesday, and then on Thursday, I get this build dropped on me, and I got to do the whole thing. I have to do all the testing in the same build. That's not 
what I think of as agile development. First of all, what's the tester doing in the first 10 days? And then what are the developers doing the rest of the time? And then why don't we, actually, why don't we say that it's actually, it might be okay to call a sprint not work completed, but an attempt to complete work. In other words, we don't commit to building anything in particular. We commit to trying to build something. And then at the end of the second week or at the two week sprint, we say, okay, how are we doing? And maybe we built it. And uh, maybe we built it and a whole bunch of other stuff too. And maybe we didn't quite build it successfully. You know why we didn't? It's not because we should be whipped harder. It's not because we're living in a, a two-week waterfall process. It's because we learn stuff when we build stuff. We try things, and we discover, as we're trying to build stuff, we discover just how hard it is to build it. So instead of making that a contract, contractual negotiations, instead of making it a contract, let's make it two weeks at which we agree to do a deep check-in on, on how we, we're doing, what, what, what we've done, and, and where we're going, and how we got there, and, and what got in our way, and what we've learned. That's a true spirit of Agile to me. And I think testers, just as much as project managers, just as much as scrum masters, just as much as developers, can help keep us on that path. The idea that we don't have to do everything in two weeks. It, it, it's good to try it, and it's good to see how we do and feed back what we've learned from failing into the process of trying to do other stuff in the next sprint. So that was a problem, you know, it's a wonderful humanist approach to software development and then all of a sudden along came the marketers, <laughs> the certificationists, uh, the different tribes, there were the crafts people, right, the, the XP people, and then there were the, the sort of empathy people, empathy people who, who were really focused on, well, can't we all just get along? And then there are also the people who just thought of agile development as swim lanes and sticky notes and Kanban boards and that sort of stuff. But no, we, we, we can learn something for all three of those tribes of agile. But uh, um, my particular uh, uh, affinity, it seems, is with the crafts people who really just want to get good at what we do and, and provide good services to people. I'm just going to skip over this. Oh, except for the fact that, oh my god, really? Five minutes, is that what you're saying? Holy Hannah, i got to go like crazy. What we're doing when we're trying to test a piece of software is we're trying to find out about risk. You could have told me at the beginning I would have paced myself a little better. <laughs> but you know what? It's just like being a tester. What are you going to do? Time's up. All right. We got to start telling stories about risk. Some person or persons will experience, that is to say, they'll be affected by, at least once, a problem, something that leads to bad feelings. And those bad feelings come from loss or harm or diminished value or annoyance or destruction of value, of hurting somebody and people feeling bad about that. That's what we mean by a problem. With respect to some something that somebody wants, that can be detected by a feeling or by a principle or by a tool or by comparison or picture in some set of conditions, maybe all the time, maybe only sometimes, because of a vulnerability that is like a bug or a, a, a feature that's not there or something that doesn't work consistently with what somebody wants about it somewhere in the system. Those are the elements of our model of testing, if you like, in rapid software testing. And that's what risk is all about. Probability times impact? Give me a break. Let's look deeply at what it really means to have risk, that the business is going to suffer some problem. Business is going to suffer some diminished value because of problems in the product. And that's what we as testers have to figure out, not automating Unit checks, not automating integration checks, and certainly not automating the GUI checks. Uh, you know, Zoran, you were saying, why do, uh, 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 that, what's the problem with testing? And there was something that you said, which I, I uh, alas, kind of disagree with, which is, uh, well, you know, we write a whole bunch of tests, but tests aren't something you write, uh, and we train them on the GUI. But the machinery isn't going to tell whether somebody's going to be pissed off or annoyed or frustrated or exasperated. There is value in those things, maybe sometimes by saying, well, is the thing even there for them to find? 
have we left it out somehow or other? But we need human testers to make complex social judgments. Complex social judgments. Not just making sure that the machinery works right. It's an idea that comes to us from uh, a fellow named Harry Collins. We need to act like human beings and interact with the product. You know how we do that? Among other things, we use the damn thing. I hear so little talk from testers in the testing community, people at conferences, about interacting with the product, playing with the product. Play has a terribly bad reputation, it seems to me. But play is what we do as humans as we start to learn things so we can figure out how to get good at them. So testing, especially at the beginning, is a f an informal process, not an excessively formalized one, an informal process by which we play with the product. Or with the specification, we have little thought experiments. We, we, have, we use our, our playful imaginations to imagine what would happen if this happened or that happened. So what does testing look like in agile contexts? Individuals and action, uh, interactions over process and tools? Well, let's focus on the skill set and the mindset of the individual tester. If it's over work and software, over comprehensive documentation, that's eliminate wasteful documentation and emphasize investigation and learning. If it's over customer collaboration, if, it, if that's what it's about, then let's answer the needs of the client and the team. Collaborate with them. And if it's responding to change over following a plan that's important, then let's respond rapidly to the ever-changing missions of testing. That's what we have to learn to do as testers, it seems to me. Now, the question is always, what can I get away with? <laughs> because he held that five-minute sign up about five minutes ago. There's that agile development cycle. High value of the product at the top, low cost of development at the bottom, building mindset in the bottom right-hand corner because that's where the developers live, testing mindset in the upper left. And how does that play out? Well, as we discover something worth building, we envision success. And as we do that, we build some of it, focusing on the little things that we're building. We build with change in mind, anticipating failure, so that we can study what we built. And when we study what we built, we defocus. Let's put that in a slightly different way. We discover something worth building. As we do so, we develop the design so that we can build some of it. As we do that, we build cleanly and simply so that we can build it with change in mind. As we do so, we foster testability. We build a testable product. We put stuff into the product to make it more testable. We arrange the ships and the deck chairs around the project to make it more testable. We develop ourselves as testers so that the product is more testable with respect to us. And we try to build the product cleanly and simply with, with uh, uh, a well-tested, well-known components so that uh, uh, the product is more uh, epistemically testable. That is to say, since if a product we know a lot about is easier to test than a product we don't know very much about. And we emphasize value-related testability. And we don't do this in just one big tour. Development is a fractal. Each of those four panels applies to every scale of development you can imagine, from the sprint, to the feature, to the use case, to the story, to the whole scope, the whole arc of the product, right down to the smallest line of code in the smallest class. We're, we're going around that process. We're fostering testability even in lines of code. What we're trying to do is take those four subcontexts of testing, intention, discipline as we're building, preparation as we're getting ready to test it, and realization in two senses, uh, bringing something to reality, but also recognizing problems in it, recognizing undiscovered value, recognizing how it actually works. So those, there are four questions in those four contexts. Do we know how this thing should work? That's, that's the, the, the building and, and the development mindset, developing the design. Did we build what we think we built? Uh, that's what the programmers are doing every minute of every day as, as they're putting in those unit checks. Can we test it efficiently? And do we know about every important bug? That's what happens in each one of those four quadrants. Now, I've got to end with a big bang. I've got to end with a big bang because I've got Dozens of slides here. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, rapid software testing. Let's do that. 
Rapid software testing is a mindset and a skill set. You've seen me sort of demonstrate some of it by talking about it a little bit, but you haven't really seen me test. That's kind of too bad. It'd be nice for you to see me test. Uh, but it's uh, focused on how to do testing more quickly, less expensively, more credibly, and accountably. That is entirely consistent with what agile development is all about. So here's the Big Bang. <laughs> Two minutes. <laughs> That's really interesting. <laughs> it's like going to the program manager and saying, there's still a couple of bugs, still a couple of missing features. Uh, can you give us a little more time? And he slips the schedule. That's jolly decent of you. All right. You know what? There's uh, lots of material. I, there's, there's, there's tons of material on the web. And uh, I'm going to make these slides available to you on the web, right? I, I do that. This is a service we offer. But because you're all just as thirsty as I am, let's do this. How can we, in agile context, and in any other context for that matter, Test more deeply, more valuable, uh, valuable, more funly. No, no, I did that on purpose. Here's my suggestion, my benediction, my blessing to you as you leave this evening and go drink beer and win prizes and have fun. Here's what I like you to do as uh, uh, testers, and even as developers doing testing. You can do this too, because developers do test. Developers are great testers. A lot of testers would say, what? No. You can only say that if you'd never watched a developer working. Developers are amazing testers. They find 99% of the problems in their own stuff. They need us for that other 1%, right? Right? Because, I'm, I don't know about you, I find 99% of the problems in my stuff too. And that other 1% I need people for. And the more skilled they are, the better. If I'm writing something, I want a skilled editor. If I'm programming something, I want a skilled tester. If I'm, uh, 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 well, we got married and I got a skilled marriage uh, uh, wedding consultant. To, and you know what? The whole thing went really well. <laughs> Listen, here we go. We're going to make this really easy. If you follow this, these suggestions, I think, I hope, your testing will increase really wonderfully no matter who you are. First of all, try replacing verify that with challenge the belief that. We're not here to verify that the product works. We're not here to show that things are OK. We're not here to provide quality reassurance. We're here to challenge the product. Validate, replace that with investigate. Confirm that, no, find problems with. Show that it works. Nuh-uh. That's, that's demonstration. That's not testing. Discover where it doesn't work. That's testing. Pass versus fail. Off you go, pass versus fail, on your bike. Is there a problem here? Executing test cases. <coughs> Let's replace that with performing experiments, because scientists don't perform science cases. Right? Scientists learn by experimentation. That's what we can do, too, as testers. Counting test cases. Oh, my God. Let's replace that with describing coverage. And in the, in the notes to this presentation, it's, it was even planned to be an appendix to this presentation. You'll see how we can do that. Automated testing. Let's replace that with programmed checking, because testing can't be automated. Test automation. Same kind of deal. Let's think about that in terms of using tools in powerful ways. We're not automating the testing. We are being skilled users of tools. Use cases. All right, programmers can use use cases, but as testers, I want more than that. I want to do more than that. I want use cases and misuse cases and abuse cases and obtuse cases. I want to get rid of all that uh, uh, um, uh, focus on use cases and I want to direct myself in how the product could have problems in it. And there's one more thing, and it goes right back to slide number two. See that? That's an airplane. 
coming into and out of US airspace, North American airspace, I live in Canada, uh, out of North American airspace in the last 17 years, four people have lost their lives on planes because of errors or bugs or problems caused by the aviation industry. Uh, the calculation I did suggests that it's about 30 billion trips. Three zero billion trips on airplanes into and out of US airspace, four people have died, courtesy of the airline business. Four people. One was sucked out of a window this spring, uh, uh, explosive decompression because of an unconstrained engine failure. Bits of the engine blew up, hit the window, <laughs> air rushes out of the plane, sucks her out even though she was belted in. The other three people died in one accident in San Francisco in, I believe it was 2014. They died, everybody else in the plane survived, they died because they weren't buckled in to their seat belts. Two of them died in the crash. One of them survived the crash and was run over by an emergency vehicle. Now, look at that. You could even say that of those uh, four deaths, three of them were preventable according to what the airline, the aviation industry knows and tries to tell us, and peop some people don't do it. Here is the magnificent thing that the aviation business does that we in software development could do, and we don't, but we could do it. We could do it. We could commit ourselves to this. We find bugs. Learn from every bug. As testers, we find bugs. Bugs are some of the most valuable information that we can find as long as people put that information to use. Let us learn from every bug. Thank you very much. <laughs> Namaste, thank you. Sorry to take so long, man. Somebody had to. I really have to be the bad guy to stop this, but uh, uh, excellent show. Tonight. Thank you very much. You're going to want to turn that yeah. on. I think it might have yeah, gone all the way. That's not okay. Oh, it's there at the back. There. Okay. Okay. So a quick Q and A from Michael. Even if I'm shouting. Yeah. <laughs> Here you go. Oh. Try again. Quick Q and A. We have five minutes. Uh, if someone wants to ask questions to Michael. Yes. Oh, it's Zoran. <laughs> Revenge! I asked him a question in his talk. <laughs> Stand up and talk loud. <laughs> oh, me too. I hate that. Oh, he sits down. Okay, he doesn't need the microphone anymore. <laughs> what, what's your problem with it, though, to, to, to give you your day? Yeah, okay, so there is a TV, quality control, quality check, Quality, uh, I guess. I've never heard that, but... Um, I, I think testers are testers. Uh, what does QA stand for? Okay, so testers. Uh, uh, now, put your hands up if you're a tester. Okay, keep your hand up if you're a tester. All the way up, nice and high so I can see it. It's all right, sweat stains don't show in here. All right, no, that's why a lot of people aren't even admitting it. This is really terrible. <laughs> all right. I'll just ask. Somebody can say, yes, I do, if this is true. Uh, testers, do you write the production code or fix the production code without somebody else saying, uh, no, you're not going to do that? No, none of them do that. All right, testers, do you control the schedule such that if the product is looking really good to you, you say, well, let's ship it now. Okay, you don't do that. Uh, testers, do you have hiring and firing authority over the programmers? <laughs> do you control the scope of the product? What, the, what features go in? What features come out? Do you control that? I'm not talking about saying uh, 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 pointing out problems in them. 
Do you actually control that? Do you make decisions about it? No, not there. Do you manage relationships with the customers such that uh, if the customer asks for something, you can tell the rest of the team, we're going to do this? No. OK. So how exactly do you assure quality? You don't. You don't assure quality. Management assures quality. And I would argue programmers assure quality. Programmers put the quality in. Now, you could say legitimately that you do assure one kind of quality, isn't that? Is you assure the quality of your own work. Everybody does that. Everybody assures the quality of their own work to some degree, but somebody else is responsible for assuring the quality of your work when somebody else is uh, your manager. In that sense, testers do not manage the product and they do not manage the project. The people who are quality assurance people are the people who do that. Plus, by the way, any tester who ever says that they're a quality assurance person always has a really hard time telling me what quality is. I ask them, okay, you sure quality? What's quality? <laughs> they freeze in the headlights. Now, I can help you with that if that's a problem for you. Quality is value to some person. So how do you assure value to some person? You don't. But we can save QA. If you're really, really, I would prefer you call yourself a tester. I call myself a tester and I'm proud to do it. But if you really, really want to say QA, quality assistance. That's what we do. Cam Kaner's idea, quality assistance. Or quality awareness. That's what we do as testers, quality awareness. Questions answered. We do that, too. If you want to keep QA, there's any number of ways you can do it. I, I hate it when people say, I'm a QA. What? I'm a QA. Oh, they mean quality analyst. Mmm. That's OK. That sounds all right to me, as long as they got a good notion of what quality actually is. It's value to some person or persons who matter. Uh, those are the words, by the way, of the late Jerry Weinberg, who he didn't drink, but my goodness, uh, uh, we owe him an immense debt in this business. Uh, the, the, one of the best favors I could ever do for anybody in here who is affected by testing or who does testing or who does programming or who is affected by programming, read Weinberg. And in particular, uh, uh, for as a tester, Perfect Software and Other Illusions About Testing is the name of the book. An Introduction to General Systems Thinking, Quality Software Management, Four dead tree books that have been changed into eight uh, e-books. Uh, uh, Jerry's work is a magnificent inspiration to us, and I'm going to miss him like crazy. Um, and just look up interviews with Jerry uh, on the web or in your favorite podcasting service, and, and what you will do is you'll connect yourself to a fire hose of wisdom. Jerry understood what quality was about. Uh, to me, uh, here's why I think people got called quality assurance engineers. For the same reason that garbage men got called sanitation engineers, we needed a grander title for them. I'm serious about that. Right? We wanted to make people feel better about the fact that they, their job was to, to find problems in the product and they didn't have the power to fix it, so we called them quality assurance engineers. And I, just what? You know, put on a nicer hat or something. You know, or, or get a get a tattoo. Or, you know, do something to make your feel make yourself feel better, but don't misrepresent yourself. Here's what we do: we test software, we experiment with software to find out the truth about it. Just like scientists experiment. Well, not the truth, truths. Uh, uh, we just like scientists test nature and and and, and chemistry and, and physics and 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 like just like engineers do testing. We, we can take on those roles. Those are wonderful things for us to do. Let's be proud of being testers. Let's do that. Thanks for the question. Great question. Any more? Are we done? I'm happy to do more. A uh, few kick more. Michael's running out of beer, so. <laughs> That's right. Oh, Davor. I have one question in favor to like uh, to the semantics. Uh, uh, it's actually not a question; it's more of a comment, but it, it will like break down to question. And it's uh, about like uh, 
the name that like, of the tester. When I was like uh, traveling around, and when someone asked me who, who am I, who am, who I am, I usually said uh, I'm working in IT or like in software. I I I, I admit that I uh, was I was like uh, uh, circumventing the fact that I am a tester uh, because it would hard it would be hard to him to understand what I am actually doing. One, one part, the second part, I was a bit ashamed. It, it's the true, it's true. I think is, if, if, there is, if there are sort of testers here who didn't uh, felt that, uh, maybe there are, but the reasons for that is that sort of change, tester, testing actually changed over time and where I felt that. Now, uh, when people say that they are doing test automation, they, they, they don't say that they are doing uh, automated checking because they are ashamed to say that because the te the word testing became more like more like popular in in in, in the in, in the in the in the in the in the language of, of the software so we 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 do we do not depend on the automation but the automation is like it's very good to have it because as you say powerful usage of the tool of the tools yeah. so this is not only a semantic issue but we will always have this phasal shift the queen doesn't has have legs you know that the queen because you cannot say that the Chris has like, but he, so it's it's hidden from from the from the language. So now we have this like we did we, we are uncovering the word testing. Uh, so my point my point point is when we are th this is also the phase phase shift when we're calling test automation test because it's like I'm automating the checks. It's, it doesn't uh, it doesn't sound cool. So doesn't sound grand. Okay. So here's what you do. Here's what you do. You say I'm a tester. Yeah, you right? can say that. Yeah. Right? And one of the things I do, by the way, let's remember this, this important thing about checking, okay? This is a really important thing to remember about automated checking. Again, if a check uh, is equivalent to something that a compiler does as it compiles code, who are the most badass programmers around? They're the compiler writers, right? Among the most badass uh, uh, programmers. Compiler writers, what do they call themselves? Programmers, right? They call themselves programmers. They don't, they don't make a bit, oh, what do you do? Well, I, uh, 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 I write compilers. Really? Shit. Wow. <laughs> Dude. You know, we could have that uh, um, for the people who build uh, 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 test frameworks, right, the, 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 who build those sorts of things. They could have that kind of reputation. You know why? Because they need, if they're really going to be good, they need two things. Two things. They need significant skill in testing, and they need equally significant skill in programming. Wow. That's like somebody who is like a, a pilot and a karate expert at the same time, right? That's somebody who's, who's really good at two quite different domains. So uh, what I would suggest is uh, uh, I'm a tester who specializes in programming automated checks or programming test frameworks. And if somebody said that to me, I'd say, hi, how you doing? Nice to meet you. It's always a struggle, and you know what? The, uh, the key to it is, I, listen, I can't tell anybody what to call themselves. If you want to call yourselves a QA, a QA, that's weird, but you can do that if you want. Anybody can call themselves anything they like. Uh, what I would like you to consider, though, is the effect that ha that has on the rest of the community, right? It, it, because it helps to shape the global impression of what's going on. I am not, as James and I were talking about this week, somebody said, oh, language police. No, language police is not what we are because to be a police person, you have to have authority over someone else. We have no authority over anybody. We can't tell anybody what to do. We can't tell anybody what to call themselves. We can't tell anybody, and we don't want to. We want people to assert themselves, but let's talk about how, how we're going to do that, how I'm going to do it, how you're going to do it, and then let us follow our lights because it is important to us, to me, to James, and to other members of the context-driven community that 
everybody who does testing work is his or her own agent. That's the most important thing for you to be, is to be an agent, to have control over what you do, to be a functioning, adult, independent, proud member of society. And if you want to call yourself something weird, we'll talk about it. But we can't have authority over you. That's, that's, the, other, that's the flip side of what I was saying to you, Zoran, which is, uh, I don't like it, but I bet there are lots of... Uh, I, I, this is not my business to talk about it, but I bet there are lots of black people who don't like black people calling each other nigger, right? I mean, that's, you know, uh, even black people use the N-word to describe that, and other people aggressively use that word to describe themselves. Well, that's their choice. We all have choices in this world. We get, we get to do that. And I want people to make powerful choices, and I want them also to recognize the effect that that has uh, around them, but again, who cares what I want, right? That's up to you to decide. So that, that's a really important part of, of our work, and I believe it's an important part of what it, uh, Ward Cunningham and people like that talk about too. All done? Okay. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I, I really have to be the bad guy again and uh, you are the good unfortunately guy. close the Q&A. You're the good guy because you're helping Q &A or Q &A. get to be on. Yeah, get right. to be yeah. Yes, exactly. Just a, a few. Oh. I, have a, I have a checklist, so I don't forget anything. Checklist, good. Checklists. Test scripts. Mm. Checklist, yeah. pretty so cool. So I'm, I'm a tester, actually, yeah. right now, yeah? Yes. I'm right, now, right now, I'm testing if uh, to verify that you have understanding of what's going to happen next. <laughs> okay, so we have a price context that's powered by Lenovo. I don't know if you already noticed this bowl. If you still have your paper tickets, you can put them inside here. You know what I'm talking about? I'm not eligible. Okay, only those who are present can win the prize if you are, of course, pulled out and present. That's the two. Why, why is anybody moaning about that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you're here. This is cool. Yeah. Okay. So we're gonna do this uh, prize contest on the prize contest on the on the terrace. Uh, DJ is already there. He's warming up, and uh, we need to start going there. Uh, on the way, you can get a beer. You can fill out a questionnaire. To get the goodie bag, this is a goodie bag. I hope you got it already. So get a beer, play some arcade games, and see you at the terrace for the prize contest. Once again, thanks to all the speakers. The organizers. Thanks to the attendees. Thanks to the sponsors. Thanks to the organizers. Thanks to all of you today. See you. See you at the terrace.